Hi everyone, I'm Rachel Carpatella, Program Director with Sustainable Westchester, and I am so pleased to present our webinar, Funds and Technical Assistance to Decarbonize Municipal Buildings, Schools, and Affordable Housing. This webinar is sponsored by our partner, NIFA, the New York Power Authority. And our commercial clean heating and cooling program is supported by NYSERDA. I want to thank Scott Smith for all your invaluable support of our work over the years. NYSERDA, uh, the New York State Climate Law leads the nation. The Climate Leadership and Community Protection Act calls for a 70% renewable energy by 2030. 40% of greenhouse gas emissions reduction by 2030, and 35% of benefits of clean energy and energy efficiency programs delivered to disadvantaged communities. NYSERDA is supporting these goals by expanding access to op opportunities to decarbonize buildings. I want to say special thanks to Donovan Gordon, Will She, and Sue Dougherty, as well as Dana Levy, for recognizing the growing need and opportunity for community thermal networks, particularly for affordable housing and municipal buildings, and expanding this funding to those buildings. And thanks to the Clean Green Schools Program and Hannah Morgan for ensuring that that program is involved, available to all schools so that we can reach these climate goals. Sustainable Westchester is a nonprofit consortium of 45 of 46 Westchester County local governments and the county itself that facilitates effective collaboration on sustainability initiatives. Sustainable Westchester's goal is to bring socially responsible, environmentally sound and economically viable solutions that create healthy, resilient, sustainable communities. Sustainable Westchester programs include our community energy programs, Westchester Power and Community Solar, Building Energy, commercial clean heating and cooling, energy smart homes and grid rewards, electrification solutions, clean transportation, sustainable landscaping, land care and electric transition, and zero waste recycle right app. Sustainable Westchester has been running clean heating and cooling community campaigns for several years and the demand for these services is clear and interest has only been growing. We hear from our municipal members, schools, and affordable housing providers that access to support only for uh, systems benefit charge paying customers or here in our territory, utility territory, Con Ed Electric customers is a constraint. We see how commercial property owners, Con Ed customers benefit from programs made available to them by NYSERDA and the utility itself. To meet our climate goals and create economic growth and opportunities for Westchester, we need to address this and create more support for institutions that serve as models for the community and serve disadvantaged communities. Our speakers today, uh, our first speaker is Sue Dougherty, program manager with the community, uh, Community Heat Pump Program of NYSERDA. And Sue, I welcome you to share your screen. All right, so everybody should be seeing my slides up on the screen now. Um, 
As I mentioned, or as Rachel mentioned, my name is Sue Doherty. I'm on the clean heating and cooling team at NYSERDA, and I manage our Pond 4614 program, which is the Community Heat Pump Systems program. Goes by, um, even though the program is called Community Heat Pump Systems, you'll, ref you'll hear this technology referred to in a lot of different ways, district style heat pumps, thermal energy networks, community thermal. So these are all, these are all the same way, uh, different ways of saying the same thing. I'll just do a very quick primer on what heat pumps are and um, what district style heat pumps are. So this is examples of three different types of heat pumps. Heat pumps really just use electricity to move energy from one place to another. And the first example shows an air source heat pump. People are probably very familiar with this. You see many splits on the walls all the time in restaurants or in uh, apartment buildings. So these move energy from the outside air into the building during one season and during the other season, they move the, the move energy from the inside air to the outside. Same concept with water source and ground source. Water source and ground source being slightly more efficient, especially ground source where the ground temperature remains stable around 50 degrees Fahrenheit throughout the year. So when we talk about district style heat pumps, um, we're talking about a building, a set of buildings that are networked together with lateral piping. So over on the left is an example of individual style heat pump systems. So each building is a, a thermal island. They're getting their thermal resources from uh, each from a unique location. And this, this cartoon here shows vertical style boreholes from which the buildings are either drawing heat or rejecting heat to. There are cases where when you network the buildings together, there's advantages either, either through economies of scale or through the ability of the buildings to share thermal resources one with one another. And I'm just gonna walk through a, a couple of quick examples of what these might look like. So district style systems are not new. Uh, there's a lot of district style systems that are in college campuses or even the Con Ed steam system uses a district system to, to distribute heat to a cluster of buildings. Uh, more modern style heat pump or more modern style district systems can use heat pumps. And one example is a fourth generation type system where a central, central plant produces the heat and then distributes that out through a network of piping to different buildings. It can also distribute chilled water too. And this can be done using thermal resources either from the ground, from wastewater, or other uh, opportunistic heat resources that can be used to generate the heat. Um, another example is a fifth generation heat pump system. And this is an ambient loop design shown here where the uh, network of piping is distributing lower temperature heat water closer to 60 degrees Fahrenheit. And instead of the heat or chilled water being produced centrally and then distributed, um, the ambient temperature water uh, will be distributed to the buildings and then a heat pump inside of the building can either produce hot water or chilled water and then distribute that. And then one advantage here in an ambient style system is that thermal resources can be shared between the buildings. So one building might have a higher heating demand or maybe another building has a cooling demand and the building that has a cooling demand can use that rejected heat and send that to another building that needs the heat. Some examples of where district style heat pump approach um, might present a great opportunity when you have a cluster of buildings that have different thermal resources, the thermal needs, or the operating profiles of the building are different throughout the day. Uh, one example here is a healthcare facility. So you might have one area of the facility that has a high cooling demand. While that area is, is generating chilled water, the heat that's being rejected to create that chilled water could be distributed somewhere else and used for space heating as an example. Another, um, another characteristic that makes for a good district style approach is if you have proximity to a good thermal resource. So if you have land area in order to drill boreholes, but maybe you don't have that land area, area available at each building that would be connected to the district loop, this way you can move energy from one place where those boreholes are located through the network of piping to buildings that can then access it. Um, other thermal resources, like I mentioned, are wastewater, 
Uh, if you have an industrial facility or a data center that's rejecting a lot of heat, that can be used to heat another building space somewhere else in the district loop. Surface water is also a great opportunity to distribute thermal resources as well. And so this just is a very simplified example of why a, a district system might offer an advantage to three buildings. So in this example on the left, in the graph on the left, you'll see three different buildings um, with different operating profiles. If each one of the buildings has a peak at the same time, in this example at hour four, all of those loads are aggregated together and shown to produce a peak of 30 tons. In this case, you would still need 30 tons of thermal resources in order to heat those buildings. However, if you were to aggregate a cluster of three buildings where on the right, all three of them still have that same peak of 10 tons, but that peak is happening at different points throughout the day. So by aggregating together buildings that have different operating profiles, even though you have to produce 10 tons for each building, when you aggregate these together over the course of the day, it never exceeds 15 tons. So therefore you wouldn't need as many thermal resources and you'd be able to drill less boreholes. And this is an example where a district system might be a good fit for a cluster of buildings. So through NYSERDA's PON 4614 program, um, this is a funding opportunity in order to bring down the costs of, dis of determining whether or not a district style system is feasible for a cluster of buildings. Through this program, the requirement for a, a district system is it has to be at least two buildings with a combined condition space of 40,000 square feet or 10 buildings of any size. So it could be 10 residential buildings that are each 1,000 square feet. And so even though that one meet the 40,000 square foot threshold because it's 10 individual buildings, it would meet our requirement under Pond 4614 um, for, a, for a, a district system. They're upcoming, this is a competitive solicitation and we have proposal due dates every three months. The next proposal due date is August 16th and then every three months thereafter through, the, uh, through November of next year. There are four categories under PON 4614. One of the categories is a best practices guidebook category, which I'll cover briefly on the next slide. But the other three categories are meant to take a project site through the journey of determining whether or not a district style system works all the way to uh, funding for, for the construction phase of the project. And a project sites could propose to category A, B, and C or they could come in at any stage that they're ready to propose for the pond. So for example, if a project site has already done a scoping study and determined that a district style system makes sense, they can propose to category B uh, for, for design funding. And likewise, if they've already done a scoping study in the design and they're ready to put shovels in the ground, they can propose to category C and get construction funding. So projects, they can go through the whole journey of category A, B, or C, or they can jump in at any point as long as they meet the requirements for each of those categories. So as Rachel mentioned, there are, there are fun, there's funding available for both SBC uh, rate payers. So Con Ed Electric customers are any of the other major utility customers throughout New York State. And we also have funding through Pond 4614 that we added recently um, to make it eligible to non-SBC paying customers. So customers, for example, customers who are NIPA electric customers. And this is a summary of the funding caps for each one of the categories that I just described. Um, so up to 100,000 for a scoping study, up to a half a million for a detailed design, or up to 4 million uh, for, for a construction project. And then finally, category D is for best practices guidebook and uh, an expert in the field who wants to come up with a best practices uh, guidebook to share with industry can get up to $250,000 to develop that guidebook. And uh, that's, uh, that's it. So I'm Sue Doherty and these slides will be available after the presentation. I think Rachel will, or somebody from the team will share them around. And if you have any more questions, you can get in touch with me via email or phone.
Awesome. Hi, everyone. I'm Hannah Morgan from NYSERDA. I'm a senior project manager on the efficiency planning and engineering team. I coordinate the P12 schools initiative at NYSERDA, which focuses on increasing clean energy investments across schools in New York State. <clears throat> and today I'm so excited to be talking about the Clean Green Schools Initiative, because this is our first uh, P12 program that has funding for clean energy construction projects. And it's our first P12 program that is available to eligible schools statewide. Um, everything I talked through today is pulled directly from the pond. So if you have any questions, um, feel free to go through the pond or reach out to me directly. So the program is a $59 million program. And the goal of the program is to help under-resourced public schools decarbonize their building portfolio and improve indoor air quality across their buildings. So we really wanna reduce fossil fuel use in schools and create healthier environments. Um, like I said, the, the programs for under-resourced schools and how we defined it through this program is that it's all existing public schools that are designated as either high needs by the New York State Education Department or um, located in a disadvantaged community. Um, so about 58% of all public schools in New York State are eligible to participate in this program. Um, and what I'm really excited about is that systems benefit charge contribution is not required for participation in this program. So this means, you know, public schools in New York City, public schools in Westchester, in Long Island, and schools that get their power from municipalities are all eligible to participate in, in this program if they are, um, if they're under-resourced. Um, the last thing I'm super excited about is that through this program, um, we received a um, exception so that our, our funding does not reduce um, the building aid a school gets and that all of our funding goes towards the local share of the capital project. Um, so what is the program? So, so the program um, provides funding in two different tracks. Um, the first track is track one and it's open enrollment which means it's a rolling application date until we accept applications until December, 2025. And we provide funding for services that will help schools evaluate, plan for and facilitate energy reduction projects, clean energy projects and newer air quality projects. So for track one, we wanna provide the engineering and technical support so that schools can make sound decisions when planning clean energy projects. Um, track two on the other hand is competitive and the first round of funding or first round that proposals are due is July 27th. And in track two, we provide funding to implement construction projects that will help schools decarbonize their buildings. So track two funding will support schools to construct projects which eliminate or reduce fossil fuel use within, within their school. And in both track one and track two, um, we, we have funding to integrate clean energy concepts into the classroom, um, which I'll talk about a little bit more at the end of the presentation. Um, track one funding may be used towards project planning associated with track two. Um, but with this being said, it's not a requirement. Um, so if a school has a, has a project um, ready to go for track two, um, we encourage schools to apply directly to track two. Um, and we do anticipate um, ho having multiple rounds of track two in the future. So what are we really gonna um, provide in track one? So again, you know, track one is the technical assistance. So what we pay for under track one are engineering and architectural services, so energy benchmarking, energy studies, clean heating, cooling design um, funding, energy master planning, decarbonization roadmaps, clean transportation studies, indoor air quality studies. Um, we'd also pay for a district to hire an energy manager because we know a lot of these under-resourced schools, you know, the facility directors wear multiple hats. Um, so we have funding for a school district to, to hire an energy manager who would manage all the energy projects across the district. Um, we also have funding for grant writing and fiscal advising because um, we know that you know a lot of a lot of these schools might not have the capacity or bandwidth to apply for to this program, so we do have funding for grant writing. Um, and again, we we also have uh, funding for educational activities, which I'll talk about at the end of the presentation. Um, I definitely encourage everyone to review our documents and resources website because we have a very comprehensive list as to what we would support under Track One. Um, so the funding for track one, um, this, 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 uh, this table is pulled directly from the pond. And I'm gonna walk through it with everyone today. So if you're working with a school district that spends annually less than 500,000, their building cap for all track one activities, excluding energy management and educational activities is 150,000. They could receive another 100,000 to hire an energy manager. 
and another 10,000 to do educational activities. So the max amount of funding at the building level they could receive is 260,000. Now let's, sit, let's take that same district who wants to participate in multiple activities under track one. Um, the max amount of funding they could get at the district level is 300,000 for track one activities, excluding you know, energy management and educational activities. They could receive another 100,000 for energy management, another 50,000 for educational activities. So the max amount of funding the school district could receive under track one is 450,000. Now let's take the same, you know, a district that may be a large city school district that spends more than 500,000 annually on utilities. Their building cap is 150,000. They could receive another 200,000 for an higher, you know, higher energy manager and another 10,000 for educational activities. So the maximum of funding they could get at the building level is 360,000. Now let's say that same districts want to participate in multiple activities under track one. Um, the district cap is 500,000. They could receive another 200,000 for onsite energy management, another 50,000 for educational activities. So the maximum amount of funding they could receive at the district level is 750,000. Um, our goal is 100% funding. So um, you know, we, we anticipate our funding will cover 100% of the cost of the projects. Um, so let's talk through, the, you know, what, what do we require for an application on track one? We require a track one application, um, a scope of work, and a budget. Um, the applicants can be either the school or an authorized representative of the school. So let's just say an A&E firm. Whoever is the applicant is going to receive the funding for the project. Um, applicants can include more than one track one services within their scope of work and also more than, more than one building within their scope of work. Um, and again, I just encourage everyone to look at our documents and resources website because we have scope of work template documents on our website. We have budget templates on our website. Um, so there's a lot of really great resources on our website. Um, and all, all track one projects will be given a three year purchase order, which means the project has to be executed within three years. So track two of the program, um, as a reminder, track two is funding for the construction of, of decarbonization projects. There are two different project types we'd support under track two. Um, the first project type are clean heating cooling projects. So ground source heat pump, air source heat pump, and VRF systems. And the second project type we'd support under um, track two are capital projects to move toward decarbonization. Um, so we'd pay for comprehensive retrofits that impact energy consumption, overall building load, electrification of building system, building electrification readiness projects, such as you know, building envelope, heating cooling projects, distribution, um, conversion of distribution systems. And lastly, we pay for the transition to low carbon fuels. Um, the two project types we would not pay for under track two is a new fossil fuel based system and conversion natural gas. Um, so you can see you know, track two, the, the main goal of it is really reduce or eliminate fossil fuel use. Um, if a school decides to do either you know, a clean heating cooling project or a capital project to move towards decarbonization, there is a large list of other activities they can include in their proposal, such as um, a renewable energy system, a BMS system, um, energy storage system, electric buses. Um, so there are secondary services we would pay for and that are eligible under track two. Um, so I definitely just encourage everyone to look through the pond if you are interested in this opportunity. And the funding associated with track two, um, so at the building level, um, our funding, the lowest amount we'd give is 500,000 and the maximum is 3 million at the building level. We'd give it another 30,000 for educational activities and up to another million for projects that either propose to install ground source heat pumps or that propose to fully electrify both space and domestic hot water equipment with any eligible clean heating cooling technologies. So the max amount of funding a school would re could receive at the building level under track two is $4,030,000. Now let's say there's a district that wants to apply for multiple buildings within their district under track two. Um, the maximum amount of funding we would pay is 5 million for eligible project types, another 100,000 for educational activities, another million for projects that, that either propose to install ground source heat pumps or that propose to fully electrify both space and domestic hot water equipment and at least one school with any of the clean heating tooling te technologies. So the max amount of funding we'd put at the district level is $6,100,000.
Um, our goal again for track two is to cover 100% of the cost of the projects. And we definitely are encouraging schools to leverage as many different funding avenues as they can. So if they have federal funding, we encourage them to use that towards a project, um, utility incentives, really anything that's available, um, we encourage schools to, to use for this project. Um, and like I said, project costs are up to 100% funding, um, but we, won't, we wouldn't pay more than 100% of the project costs. Um, so what's really required for the, for the track two proposal package? So we require a series of questions on our online portal. Um, we require a school authorization form. This form is required if the a &E firm is, is submitting an application on behalf of the school. We require a track two proposal template. Um, this is where you know, the, the school or applicant really describes a project to our team. And then we require the track two budget template. Um, applicants, similar to track one, applicants can be either the school or an authorized representative of the school. So again, it could be the school that, that receives the funding or an a and &E firm. It's up to the school as to how they want the financing to work. Um, the one sort of um, one cutoff for us is that applicants must not have entered into a contract with a construction firm prior to applying. So what this means is that, you know, a school district could have the design done and they could to they're definitely eligible to apply to track two. Where our cutoff point is, is that if a school has signed a construction contract um, with a firm that me meaning they're about to construct the project, that's where our cutoff point is. Um, and the first round of proposals are due in about two weeks on July 27th by three o'clock PM. Um, again, we are gonna have multiple rounds we anticipate um, for the next two summers. And I, and I definitely encourage everyone to read the pond, ask questions, um, because there's a, a lot of information within the pond that would be valuable if you are thinking about pro proposing um, a project to the, to the program. So for track two, I'm just going to go over, you know, at a very high level, um, you know, how the proposals are going to be evaluated. So proposals will be evaluated by a scoring committee based on their overall responsiveness and specifically based on the on the evaluation criteria below, which are listed in order of importance. So the first evaluation, evaluation criteria is project impact. The overarching theme in the project impact section is decarbonization and the scale and the impact of the fossil fuel reduction project. So complex in-depth projects will receive more points. Clean heating and cooling projects will also receive more points. Other areas of interest in this section include that the methodology to quantify energy impacts is clear, well-defined and sound, that the project includes activities that will lead to reduce long-term dependence on fossil fuels, and that there is an appropriate ventilation and filtration as a result of the decarbonization project. The second evaluation criteria is a project team and stakeholder commitment. The overarching theme in the project team and stakeholder commitment section is that we want a strong project team with the experience to ensure a successful project from concept to project installation. The third evaluation criteria is a project scope of work. The overarching theme in the project scope of work section is that we wanna make sure the projects are well thought out by having clear understanding of how the project will be implemented through clear and concise tasks and tangible and concrete deliverables. The fourth evaluation criteria is the clarity of the budget. The overarching theme in the clarity of budget section is that the budget clearly describes the total project costs, including other funding sources being used for the project and it describes the time frame for securing the funding. And lastly, the last evaluation criteria is the clean energy educational and professional development activities. The overarching theme in this section is whether or not your project engages students and staff in the clean energy, clean energy educational activities such as offering a clean energy internship, creating a new course around clean energy topic, or integrating a clean energy project-based learning activity into a course. Um, and the last thing I'm gonna go over are the, um, you know, I've, I've spoken about throughout the presentation that we have funding for clean energy educational activities. Um, so through this program, through both track one and track two, we have funding um, to support a range of workforce development and student educational activities for P-12 students that explore, support, or promote decarbonization efforts in their schools and communities. Um, on our website, we have a list of existing activities that schools could leverage um, that would be that would fit well under this program. Um, but if a school wants to design their own program, we also have a guide to how to design a program. What we pay for is very open-ended through, through um, this, this sort of offering. 
we'd pay for curriculum development, licenses fees, software subscriptions, you know, tools, equipments, field trips, textbooks, uh, clean energy toolkits, conferences, camps, you know, uh, professional development fees, food, travel, and lodging. Um, so as you can see, the list is very comprehensive. And the goal, really the goal is to empower teachers to get these concepts in the classroom, to get kids excited about, you know, clean energy and decarbonization. Um, so this funding is available in both track one and track two. Um, the, tr the funding associated with track one at the building level is 10,000. Um, the funding associated with uh, at the district level is 50,000. If a school wants to include educational activities in their track two proposal at the, at the building level, the, co the um, cost share cap is 30,000. And at the district level, it's 100,000. Lastly, just some important dates um, to remember. So the um, first round of the um, track two due dates is July 27th at three o'clock PM. Um, so if you know of any schools that are under resourced that would fit, you know, might have a project that is eligible tra for track two, um, definitely encourage them to uh, apply to, you know, the program. Um, and again, you know, I've re reiterated this before during the call, but if you are interested in the program, um, definitely check out our website. There's a lot of great resources on our website. Um, and just one last thing I was going to cover, you know, before we, um, before we go to the next presenter is that we do have another program in the market for non under-resourced schools. Um, it's called the green and clean energy solutions program. And this program provides cost sharing for energy studies and clean heating, cooling design projects at a 75% cost share, um, capped at 150,000 per project and 300,000 if they do a study in a design. Um, the eligibility for this program is that they must pay into the SBC and the sites could be publicly or privately owned building. Um, so do, if you do know of any schools that would fit under this program and are interested in doing, you know, a clean heating, cooling design project or study, um, I definitely encourage them to um, look into this program. And I will turn it over to the next presenter. Thanks, Rachel. All right, so my name is Leo Wigman. I'm director of solar programs and sustainable West Sister. Thank you to my assistants, uh, my colleagues here for assistance on getting slides going. We're gonna to talk today about a specific program in which um, sustainable Westchester has been collaborating with the New York Power Authority to bring solar, uh, community solar projects to sites that are owned by local governments and school districts within Westchester County. Uh, and so this is a form of technical assistance that we're providing in collaboration with the uh, New York Power Authority. We'll talk about the roles and goals for this program, which we call the Westchester Community Solar Partnership, who's eligible to participate, what kind of sites make sense, the progress we've made to date, and how does a municipality or school district participate. Uh, this slide depicts the four partners and their individual roles in this program. Uh, again, the New York Power Authority is the procurement agent for its customers for this program and has selected three solar firms with specific areas of expertise based on a review process. And these selected solar developers are participating in the program with a letter of uh, participation with the New York Power Authority. Uh, municipalities and school districts are submitting potential sites to the New York Power Authority. Uh, and we'll talk briefly about that later. Ultimately, when a site is successful with a solar developer, the solar developer will sign a lease agreement with the school district or municipality. And the municipality and school district at this point has no particular capital expenditure whatsoever. Uh, the Sustainable Westchester's role here is to provide customer service acquisition for these community solar sites that are located on school district roofs or municipal roofs or municipal parking lots or school district parking lots. And we provide that service to the, the, the selected solar developers on a project by project basis. And additionally, we also help support the municipalities and school districts uh, in advance of all this with any kind of background member services they may need. And uh, the way it kicks off is that the municipality and school or school district will sign a memorandum of understanding between itself and New York Power Authority that authorizes the New York Power Authority to proceed with uh, examining its, the facilities of that local district. And, uh, I should be able to hit quick. Um, eligibility in our case is uh, restricted to New York Power Authority customers in Westchester County. Uh, and those customers, as I mentioned, will sign a non-binding memorandum of understanding with New York Power Authority 
it, for submitting sites and or facilities to be considered in this particular program. Uh, the second step of that is after that memorandum of understanding is submitted and a list of sites is, is, is submitted, the uh, municipality or school district would then meet with the selected solo developer and if interested at, after that, then organize for on-site visits of those particular roofs or parking lots. The ideal, uh, what I should mention is that the, these projects will typically take 16 to 20 months from start to finish. So there's a series of steps that have gone through. Largely the, the first important step is, is for the site to be submitted to the utility for interconnection review. Uh, and that's an important milestone, one of the first. Um, the type of roofs that are ideal for this situation are flat or low pitched roofs with at least 25,000 square feet. Roofs that are in good condition or are not terribly old or can be uh, repaired within a small modest budget that could also be built into this project um, will, be, will be acceptable to the project. In this particular case, I'm showing you a roof of a relatively low pitched series of buildings which comprise roughly one acre of roof that's either southeast or southwest facing, so pretty good from a solar perspective. And that roughly one acre of rooftop on those low pitch roofs would generate roughly 600 kilowatts of solar, which is enough for 80 households of annual energy. In this particular case, we're looking at a parking lot located here in Westchester County, and those double rows of head-in parking are actually optimal for providing solar canopies on top of those where the posts for the canopies would, would line up with that center line and not remove any parking spaces. And in this particular case, the canopies are almost always 12 to 13 feet high. So our ample clearage for snow plows and school buses or delivery vehicles. Um, and in the, when you add up the, the number of parking spaces that are these parallel rows that are almost south facing, you end up with 380 spots in this particular parking lot that could carry one megawatt or more of solar or enough for about roughly 180 homes of annual energy. Um, and uh, Parking lots don't have to be this big. I just picked two sweet spots that came to my attention in the last week or so that we've been working with. Currently, we have uh, been in 2020, uh, roughly 2,200 sites were submitted to New York Power Authority for this process by 25 municipalities out of our 45 in, in Westchester County and eight of our uh, roughly 20 school districts. So roughly half the municipalities and school districts participated so far with an initial list. Of those, New York Power Authority did a quick sort of screening for site size and site adequacy and passed on after it selected the three developers through its own process as a procurement agent on behalf of the municipalities and school districts, its customers, passed on 64 sites in seven different municipalities and four school districts to developers. Uh, we currently have developers who are pursuing projects with five municipalities out of those seven and three school districts who have site license or site lease and due diligence agreements to review. And we've just signed the first agreement between the first municipality for the first rooftop solar system that will be located on their public works facility that will provide uh, local, uh, the uh, offset essentially the local solar credits for roughly 35 or 40 local families. And we're targeting low to moderate income households for that. I should mention each of the four partners in this um, partnership New York Power Authority, and thank you, New York Power Authority, for being a sponsor of our webinar today. Uh, the uh, municipalities and school districts, the solar developers, and state of Westchester all have a, one common goal, and that one common goal is to advance the New York uh, State uh, climate goals of essentially 100% renewable by 2040, as as Rachel mentioned at the outset, or 70% by 2030. So that's a common goal that all the partners share. Individually, each of the partners, of course, share their own individual goals in the case of New York Power Authority, it sees this ongoing statewide demand for renewable energy that it's trying to foster. Local school districts and municipalities are looking for ways of potentially monetizing uh, a facility space that's not currently monetized, either by receiving small lease payments for these parking lot air rights or rooftop air rights, or receiving a sort of discounted solar credits for their portion of what's the energy that's produced. Sustainable Westchester's goal here is to uh, develop additional solar capacity that can serve the low to moderate income households that we've identified in Westchester County who would be first in line for the solar credits that these community solar projects would, re would produce. And we feel that's very important in keeping in line with the social and, and, and climate justice aspects of the state goals. Um, the, the final thing I'll mention is that uh, the, 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 the thing that to do next, if you're interested, is to, is to contact me. Uh, and I'll put you in touch with our, our liaison, Ben Cuozo, at New York Power Authority, and the, the one-page memorandum of understanding that 
lets you authorize them to go ahead and take, take, take a look at your site in your city, town, village, or school district. And we're happy to make the contact and be the facilitator. Um, thank you very kindly. Now we will go into our question and answer section. We have received some questions in the chat, which I will um, which I will go through now. So if you have any other questions at this point, please do put them in the chat. And if everyone can still continue to stay on mute and off camera, that would be very helpful. Thank you. Um, our first question was from Peter Nance. He asked, and this question goes to you, Sue. Um, how does microgrid technology work with heat pump systems? Sure, thank you for that. Uh, so microgrid, you know, as I understand it, would be the network of renewables or storage or other electrical resources that would help a set of buildings either be islanded off of the electrical grid or be interconnected to the electrical grid. I see that is harmonizing well with a district heat pump system. So district heat pump system could either use the electrical resources from the primary grid or when available, use the electrical resources from the microgrid. Thanks, Sue. Next, we have a question from Lauren Bryce, my colleague at Sustainable Westchester. She asked, would schools, so this question is for you, Hannah. Um, the next group of questions are going to be for you, Hannah. Um, would schools be using the educational slash clean energy concepts funding to pay their own teachers or would they be looking to use that money to hire energy education companies? Yeah, this is Hannah. Um, yep, they could, you can use the funding to pay your own teachers or um, you know, paying for different companies to provide the services. Great, thanks. Next, Nicole Foreman asked, did I miss the funding deadline for round one of track one? So what is the funding deadline? Yep, it's um, open until December, 2025. So it's, um, you still have a couple of years to apply to it. I mean, if you have any questions about the application process, feel free to reach out to me directly. Now we have Rachel Rosen of Wex Energy. Is this for public schools only or does any accredited school in New York State qualify? Um, it is only for public schools. Carol Upshur asks, does the school's program address overall ventilation that is now being recommended to assist in preventing respiratory illness spread like flu and COVID? Yep, so for both track one and track two, um, ventilation filtration is a big priority. Did you know? So, oh. She sent the note out, so she's got up All right, so because he's wrong. If everyone could kindly mute, it sounds like we have some background noise. And Hannah, were you done answering that question? Nope, sorry, I was, I was put on mute. Um, so yeah, both, okay. track one, sorry, um, both track one and track two is, are very focused on ventilation filtration. Um, so for track one, um, there's funding for indoor air quality studies. And for track two, there's funding to upgrade, um, you know, the ventilation filtration system. So um, a large priority of, of this program is to create healthier schools um, environments for school, you know, school children, teachers. Great. Nicole Foreman asked, what if a district has some school buildings under resourced or under resourced and some that are not? Yep. So only the um, only the uh, eligible schools are um, able to participate in this program. So the high needs definition is at the district level. So if a school district is high needs, all their buildings eligible. If a district only has um, one building that is located in disadvantaged community, only that one building can participate in the program. And that spreadsheet is available on the website. Yeah, great point, Rachel. Yeah, so there's there's a very uh, comprehensive Excel sheet on our website that everyone can um, download just to see what schools are eligible for the program. Peter Nance asked, are these track two forms downloadable from your web portal? Yeah, so the track two, yeah, if you go to the PON website, um, the, the track two proposal template and track two budget template are available to be downloaded. 
Thanks so much, Hannah. Now we have a couple of questions for Leo. Leo, you're up. The first question came from Dan Breyer and Dan asked, does a roof site of 25,000 square feet or greater have to be continuous or can it be spread over multiple buildings within a site? Uh, so no, it can be spread over uh, multiple buildings as long as uh, they're not too far apart. The example I gave you were two buildings that were that formed an L that were 30 feet apart. The, the main the main the main thing is that that the um, in, that the connection of that solar system or, or series of arrays on multiple roofs have one point of interconnection with the utility, so that there's only one application to the utility for interconnection of however many roofs are put together. But if obviously if it takes 15 roofs to get to 20,000 square feet, then 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 that may be an opportunity that is too costly on an individual basis. But we're happy to, you can contact me and I'll happy, happily walk you through uh, what facilities you may be thinking about, whether they're in Westchester County or not. Thank you. Another one for you, Leo. Bob D asked, what is the financial opportunity, perhaps a normalized value of how much ink, uh, sorry, there's a cursor there, so I can't say thank you, how much income to the school district if they are chosen for a solar project? So uh, th th that depends a little bit on whether, um, what kind of incentives are available at the time of application uh, and what the uh, construction costs will likely be for the situation. We've had situations where uh, the lease cost, the lease, um, where, where the, the facility owner has requested that there be, for example, a roof repair built into the project. And the solar developer has fully agreed to do that. Um, essentially front loading the lease and therefore that 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 front loading of that roof repair diminished the lease payment because those dollars came early in the project uh, so that it, it, most of the developers we're working with are quite flexible about that um, it isn't always going to be a, a large dollar lease uh, but there may be other community benefits to participating okay and I see um, I own Simone Simone Nides asked, are there any examples of affordable housing developments that have developed a community solar project? Um, so the, I, I can't think of the, some in any in Westchester at the moment, but we're actively pursuing that. Uh, some of it, the, many of the affordable housing uh, projects actually have rather limited roof space. Uh, and so that's a bit of a challenge when you take, if they're, if they're mid-rise buildings with flat roofs, which is quite common in the affordable housing market, um, the fire code now requires a 10 foot setback from parapet edges if the parapets are not more than 46 inches tall. So for most roofs, if they're 30 feet wide, now, now suddenly with 10 foot uh, you know, setbacks, now you only have 10 feet in the middle, you can put something on. And if there's, so, so it's, it's been a bit of a challenge to figure out how to do that with a lot of the affordable housing sites, but we're we're actively working on a program uh, to 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 address that with the the various affordable housing multifamily affordable housing providers in in Westchester County. Right, and are you using NYSERDA New York Sun incentives for the solar project? Uh, so yes, each of our solar developers that's working on these particular um, municipal or school district sites does definitely plan to take advantage of the New York Sun incentives that are available, which have just been released uh, and, for, and, and uh, in many ways advantage the kind of work we're doing here in Westchester. Um, so we're, we're, the, the developers are definitely going to take advantage of that to lower their construction costs and make these projects more viable. One significant change that New York State New York Sun introduced was it introduced a special uh, incentive, a higher incentive per watt of solar installed for projects that were 200 kilowatts in size or slightly smaller, um, rather than starting that at a five times larger size. So as a result, there are a number of projects that didn't pencil out before that were smaller uh, that might pencil out now. So where, where you wouldn't necessarily need all of a 25,000 square foot roof, you might be only need 15,000 square feet of roof. So these late changes in the rules are, 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 are sort of having the solar development community and ourselves sort of go through the entire uh, uh, roster of potential sites and reevaluate the performance on these. But we'll we're just only in the start of this process. We're happy to have more discussions with more municipalities about additional sites, uh, parking lots, commuter lots for train stations, uh, et cetera. 
Great, and I, I wanted to circle back to that question about um, examples of affordable housing developments that have developed a community solar project. I just wanted to mention that we do know of examples of affordable housing developments with, um, we have examples of uh, community heat pump systems Correct. at affordable housing developments um, and of um, decarbonized buildings, um, not necessarily community style, but uh, even single uh, heat pump systems um, and geothermal at affordable housing. So if there's interest there, um, you can reach out to me and I'll provide you with those examples. We have a couple more questions. We're down to the last three minutes and I have a one o'clock meeting, so we will be ending this on time. Um, if we don't get to any questions, we will respond to them. Um, we'll be putting together a document with our, our questions, uh, any outstanding questions and answers. And we'll include that in our follow-up email to um, all of our registrants along with the so, uh, slide decks. So the last questions that I see here are, um, are for Leo, are you looking at placing collect the collectors? So I think they're talking about the solar panels um, on the building facade. Leo, you're on mute and your camera's off if you were planning to answer that. So I've been chatting the whole time, sorry. Uh, mm -hmm. y yes, uh, we'd be interested to learn more about that technology, uh, Richard. You can certainly reach out to me. I just emailed you my uh, Leo at westchester.org email address. Great. And then last, um, for solar installations, wouldn't there have to be one point of connection per meter or utility bill when it comes to multi-building per site projects? Um, is, is that a question for solar interconnection? Yes. Yeah. So, so typically, you, you can have as many points of interconnection with the grid as you want, but for each one of them, there's a relatively big stack of paperwork and, and solar in, electrical design you have to go through. So, if you can if you can make one application because you've got a roof mount and a parking lot together, and, and you can do them both simultaneously to make one connection, that's more efficient from your uh, interview and review process with the utility. Thank you so much to Sue Dougherty, Hannah Morgan, and Leo Wiegman. Thank you, New York Power Authority, NYPA, for your support, without which this webinar would not have been possible. Thank you, NYSERDA, for your support of Sustainable Westchester's Clean Heating and Cooling Campaign and for the development of the programs that we have brought forward today to our network, uh, to our webinar participants, Thank you for your participation and attention today and your interest in decarbonizing your buildings. Um, Sustainable Westchester is here to help you move forward with applications to these valuable programs you heard about today. We're glad to be part of your project team to help you identify best fit resources for your building, leverage available programs, stack incentives, participate in grant development, education, energy education programs, and connect you with vetted solution providers. Thank you so much. We will follow up with the resources we shared today. Everyone take care.